This podcast is brought to you by Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine for those that love to make and drink great beer. Learn more online or subscribe at beerandbrewing.com or find us on social media at Craft Beer Brew. It's episode 265 of the Craft Beer and Brewing Podcast, and we've got a direct fire episode coming to you this Tuesday uh, episode. And uh, joining me for this direct fire, somebody, I teased this one, I don't know, mo- uh, probably two months ago, and it's taken us a little while to make it all happen. Um, probably my fault, um, but I'm glad that we're finally having the conversation and joining me from California is Matt Brindleton from Firestone Walker. Welcome back, Matt. Jamie, it is always a pleasure. I mean, I've seen you since the last time we did a podcast. Uh, thankfully, I was able to get out there last summer, and uh, we got to hang out for a little bit. Um, we filmed some classes with Firestone Walker and had some late night beers. I, I, I don't know how you do it, um, but it was great to see you. Uh, and I'm still wearing I'm still wearing my Firestone Walker hoodie right now because it's gotten cooler out. I showed up figuring it's July. We're filming. Like, why would I need a, anything for cold weather? <laughs> and then then we were in your barrel cellar filming with Eric Ponce. And uh, yeah, it's it's kind of cold in there to, to spend a, <laughs> the entire morning. It's so. funny we 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 film a lot in there because it's the quietest room in the brewery, but it's the coldest room in the brewery. Yeah. Well, not the coldest in the brewery, but it's a cold spot. Well, you, graciously, Sean gave me this this hoodie, and uh, it's uh, it's so comfortable. I wear it all the time now. Um, for those of you following at home, Matt is joining us for the 2023 10th anniversary Brewers Retreat uh, that craft we're throwing craft beer and brewing, uh, having up at Russian River. Um, for, you know, if you haven't been in the past, Matt, you were you were there from the very start. You oh. were from the very first year of the Brewers Retreat up at Devil's Thumb Ranch. Is, uh, I think it was what. Yeah, yeah, it is such an incredible event. Um, better than I would have ever expected. Uh, and plus you pick some pretty amazing venues and some other amazing brewers to work with. So, uh, yeah, end to end. Awesome. Excited to be doing this again. Uh, if for, if you don't have a ticket and you're interested, go get them now. I think, uh, as I was checking before we started here, we've got like four tickets left now. So, uh, we're keeping it small at 50 people. Um, of course, alongside Matt, you'll have a chance to be with Vinny and Natalie from Russian river. Ken Grossman of that tiny little brewery, you know, Sierra Nevada, right? Nobody's ever heard of them. Uh, Henry and Adriana of Monkish, Corey and Karen from Side Project, JC and Esther of Trillium, Neil Fisher of Weldworks, uh, Sean and hopefully Karen, uh, hopefully of Lawson's uh, Finest, of course. And oh, and Ben Edmonds. Ben Edmonds is uh, uh, just gave me the 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 uh, solid yes wow. uh, over the weekend. Well, uh, it's an honor to be on that list. Holy cow. You, you had me at Ken. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna team up. We're gonna team up brewers, and so you you wanna you wanna be partnered up with Ken, huh? Ooh, oh man, that'd be awesome. But I'll, I'll have to like do some homework. <laughs> well, it'll it'll be fun. Obviously, uh, you know I, I, we love watching the dynamics you guys get into this uh, brewing on homebrew systems. I'll, I'll end that... up being Ken's kettle boy. I'll just be fetching things for Ken. <laughs> You don't, you know, he's critical. He, I mean, he's he he runs a tight ship over there. <laughs> you um, think so? <laughs> oh, he, it, it, so it was. I, I've told the story before, but it's amazing to watch him even on a homebrew setup. Absolutely incredible. Anyway, if you're interested, go to brewersretreat.com, get your tickets. Uh, I've got ten questions out there, audio questions that uh, listeners have uh, submitted to the podcast. And we're going to go through those. That That's the whole nature of this direct fire episode. But before we do that, AccuBrew is a revolutionary fermentation analysis tool, unlike anything else on the market, giving brewers unprecedented insight into the fermentation process. AccuBrew helps brewers confirm consistency and avoid problems from batch to batch. From your smart device, you can track and compare sugar conversion, temperature, and clarity and use that information to continuously improve your process. AccuBrew goes beyond a simple measurement tool with the AccuBrew system. Managing your process and people has never been easier. Visit AccuBrew.io today for a no-obligation 90-day trial. Also, this episode is sponsored by CanCraft and BSG. Need cans? CanCraft has you covered. Get blank, sleeved, and printed aluminum beverage cans with low minimums, plus full service support from design through delivery. No matter the size of your business, CanCraft's design and aluminum specialists are here to guide you every step of the way. Visit bsgcraftbring.com slash CanCraft for your complete packaging solution. 
And so, yeah, you know, you you know the format of the podcast, Matt. Uh, you listen to the podcast, right? I I listen to Neil's uh, work, and I'm a little nervous. Uh, You're a little nervous. <laughs> We're going to put you on the spot here, but uh, there's no there's no wrong answer. Neil right? did a great so, job, by the way. He the buy the, the the bar is high. <laughs> well, let's see if we can pass it. We'll kick it off for the first question right here. Hi, Matt. This is Ryan from Denver. I had a question about recipe design when you're collaborating with other breweries. For example, when you're working with uh, somebody like Other Half on Pivo Snaps or somebody like Russian River uh, with Stevo, how do you decide uh, which breweries process and ingredients and techniques you're going to use for those beers? All right. Well, Ryan, that's a, a good question and, and uh, not too tough for the first question. Um, and, and what I would say is that it, it really does depend who we are collaborating with, but specifically the ones you mentioned, um, the, the collab with Other Half, uh, that was going to happen in their breweries. Uh, in fact, we brewed a beer in one of the New York brewery and one in Washington, D.C., and a lot of it was led by the materials that they had. And we were riffing, for instance, with Pivo Snaps uh, on Pivo conceptually. And, and they had some really interesting ideas on how to, you know, put their own signature twist on it. Um, but a lot of the, interesting ideas like what? Well, in that case, you know, they used they used some adjunct. So we're 100 percent malt on Pivo. Uh, there was some rice that was integrated in Pivo Snaps, making it a little snappier, crisper beer. Um, but they did go with the Saphir theme. Um, and I don't remember, I, I, I don't want to say for sure that they used the same lager yeast that, that we certainly didn't send our strain out. Let's just put it that way. They might've been using a derivation of 3470, um, but we didn't share yeast. So in that case, it really was, you know, two brewers putting their heads together, uh, riffing on one, one brewer's formulation, but producing it in another brewery. Um, you know, now you guys use pretty lean Pilsner malt. Well, we use Weirman, uh Pilsner malt for Pivo. Oh, okay. And there's a touch okay. of care of foam in that, in that beer. Um, you know, and, and we also do a fairly aggressive step, aggressive. We use a step mashing um, process, trying to get pretty good attenuation. We're not doing any decoction or anything on that beer. Um, although Sam Tierney has been playing around with, we like to say dabbling in decoction down at the propagator a lot lately. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so, but, but when we do other collaborations, what I like to do anyway, would we invite somebody into our brewery? Um, what I really like to do is allow them to put a recipe forward. And I really encourage them to suggest raw materials that we wouldn't normally have used. Um, and, and that, that allows a, a really learning opportunity for us. So I, I really enjoy that. Um, it is fun to step into other people's breweries and talk through some techniques um, and, and put a little special touch. But I think we all know how to run our own breweries. And so, you know, kind of putting somebody else's recipe into your system and running it through your process and your program is, is a really interesting way to do these collaborations. Um, I mean, we, we did more collaborations in 2022 than any other year. And we've run a ton of breweries through here, um, had a lot of fun. I mean, having Sam down at the Propagator, uh, he may take a little more aggressive approach to trying new techniques and new raw materials because it's smaller batch. Um, you know, he can bring in 100% new raw materials, mill them on site, bring whatever yeast um, he wants. So there's a lot of flexibility there. Here on the bigger system, we might, um, you know, due to scale, have to use a little more of the raw materials here in some cases, or certainly the process as it stands uh, in others. With something like Stevo, how do you take two iconic you know, American uh, pilsners and figure out some way to mesh those two? <laughs> you know that that one. Vinny and I probably talked about that over beers late at night so many times. By the time the collaboration came around, we, we just already knew what we were going to do. And what was interesting is the two recipes, the base malt recipes, uh, were very similar. And our approach to mashing was quite similar. And, and some of the pHs that we were trying to hit 
And, you know, the real, you know, differentiator maybe besides the equipment we were working on was the, the finishing hops that we use. So we just split it even 50-50, uh, 50% Aramis grown in France, uh, 50% Saphir grown in Germany. And uh, yeah, it worked out really well. All right. Well, let's pop into question number two. Hey, Matt, this is Derek from Sacramento, California. To me, Firestone Walker has been maintaining its relevancy amongst its customers throughout all the years. So my questions to you are, who comes up with new ideas for products? And can you describe the timeline from when that idea is presented to recipe development, R&D, and its final entry into the market? Also, please keep brewing Pivo. Thanks. <laughs> nice. Well, thanks, Derek. That's a good question. Um, and it's it's actually changed a little bit over the years. Um, you know, R&D, innovation, uh, new recipe formulation. We were a much smaller group 10 or 15 years ago, and we didn't have as broad of a portfolio. We hadn't tried as many things. So I feel like it was a little easier um, and, and things moved a little slower in the craft beer world. Uh, oftentimes, gosh, you know, if we even had a marketing department at those times, the people who made those marketing decisions would say, hey, opportunity for a new beer. What do you want to brew, Matt? And we'd say, you know, let's do a double IPA or let's do a Hefeweizen. And they'd say, all right, we'll go sell it. It was just pretty simple. And um, I was drawing from at that time, let's say, you know, just throwing it 15 years ago, I'd, I'd draw from either my homebrew experience or experience in other breweries or beers that I had tasted. And a lot of it was just coming out of my office, essentially. Roll the clocks forward and things have changed. Things are moving a lot more quickly. Um, we have a real marketing department and sales division that uh, is relatively demanding in wanting us to put new products out each year. Um, sometimes it's, you know, a number of products. Uh, and, and the way the calendar runs is you go out and you talk to your wholesalers, what we call our annual business presentation, which is happening right now. We've been working, you know, for the last four or five months on it. We present that to wholesalers and then we need to deliver usually in, in you know, January, February of the new year, a number of new products. So they hit the, sh the shelves. <laughs> and so it's no easy task. And so we've developed a bit of a, an R&D and innovations team. Um, and, and I'm really proud of the work that they're doing. It consists of, in, in no particular order, uh, Sam Tierney, who I mentioned earlier down at The Propagator, uh, Brad Miles, who sits at a desk here or, and works in the brewery here in Paso Robles, um, and then Kevin Troxel, who is part of our lab team. And they're, the three of them are the core of innovation where Brad is really project managing and leading the team in terms of receiving, okay, we'd like to try these types of recipes. We'd like to try these new raw materials. These types of beers are of interest to uh, the team in, in general. Uh, sales and marketing included. And then he'll put on a calendar when we would brew very small batches on our, our one barrel uh, pilot system, when they would move then down to Propagator and have Sam take some cracks at them and get that beer on draft into the restaurant so we get a little bit of feedback. Uh, meanwhile, Kevin Troxel's doing some lab analysis. And I forgot to mention uh, Craig Thomas, who heads up our sensory division, is trying to go out and mine some data in terms of what's what's working and what's not. So it's a little more involved now. A um, few more people, a few more chefs in the kitchen, and we have a few other you know senior brewers on staff that have a, a strong opinion on these things. So it's become much more of a team uh, effort. Um, that takes a lot of pressure off of me, um, especially when it comes to new product development in areas that I don't necessarily have a lot of experience in. Um, they can go and do the research and uh, it kind of creates a little bit of a structure, maybe a little more organized way of getting to the finish line. Um, you know, Brad not is marking time and has a deadline to work against and is communicating to the folks who need to know uh, how far along we are. And eventually we need to have beer that we can pour one for our wholesale partners, but ultimately uh, make it to trade. So you're kind of alert working in parallel with marketing, who's trying to develop a label that tells the story of the beer. Um, and that's kind of fun as well. You know, it's like developing the album cover of your, 
of the record that you're trying to cut in the studio while you're you're cutting the album you know <laughs> how do you how do you define the firestone walkerness of, of these new uh, kind of experimental projects mm. yeah is there it, some core to that well, I, I don't know if it's entirely, it's, I don't know that it's written down anywhere. There's hard and fast lines that define it. But certainly, yeah, there's a house character and some philosophical uh, guide rails, I guess you would say, in terms of what Firestone would like to do. And um, everybody says balance and drinkability, of course, that's part of it. But, you know, I, I feel like, yeah, there is, there is certainly a, a Firestone way of doing things that's hard to define, I suppose. And maybe as we've gotten larger, that's becoming a little more apparent in that, you know, we kind of brew right into the middle, the sweet spot, I like to say, uh, in most styles. We're never the most extreme beer out there. Um, no way. Uh, neither are we the, the, the tamest or the most watered down beer out there. I think we like to try to play right into the sweet spot. And I think, you know, the yeast rules the brewery oftentimes I say, and, and, you know, our house culture is going to drive a lot of that character, uh, especially when we're using that, that yeast, um, getting to know the, I would say the lager yeast is similar in that regard. It is, uh, it is an interesting thing, just how much you all, you know, again, given the, the scale of the brewery, because it's a significantly sized brewery now. Um, but you keep your finger on the pulse. I'm drinking a beer right now. That's a, uh, collaboration with, uh, with Humble C, a new hazy IPA that just arrived in the office last Ooh, week. That's a good one. Um, and, uh, you know, and so you guys are, are keeping it current with uh, collabs with much, much, you know, significantly smaller breweries and uh, and keeping your finger on the pulse in that kind of way. It, you bring up a good, it, I'm glad you brought up that beer because there's collaborations uh, that are happening at different levels. And that's an example of one that I really don't have a fingerprint on. That was, that was Sam collaborating uh, with the folks at Humble C. Uh, for, actually, Frank from Humble Sea is going to stop by tonight and drop off some of the collab that they brewed, which is Sivo, which is their <laughs> homage to Pivo. Nice. And uh, so, so that was that was a great kind of almost you know two way uh, collaboration that I had almost zero part of. I mean, that was that kind of its testament to uh, what's going on behind the scenes here and within that R and D and innovation group that works really well. All right, let's pop into the next question. Uh, this is a lager question for you. This is Mo in Denver. Hi, Matt. I had a question about mash schedules for lagers. When do you see it useful to do a single infusion versus a step mash versus a decoction mash? Thanks. All right, Mo. That's a great question. Um, and uh, as was evidence, I think, at the GABF and all of the Instagram pictures I saw it coming from Bierstadt and uh, all the new <laughs> lager houses. Lager is alive and well, uh, especially here in the craft community. And so it's a, it's a great topic and one I love. Um, so, uh, you know, I've had the, the great fortune, I like to say, of predominantly working in breweries with mash mixers. So I've always kind of had step mashing um, available to me. And so just about every beer we make uh, involves some type of a step mash. Um, even, if, even if we're doing the equivalent of a single infusion, we would add a mash off step. I think in just about every beer we brew, there might be a stout or two that we omit the mash off step. But when it comes to lagers, um, I'll just tell you straight out what our mash program is, and then we can work around that. So um, we actually mash in, at, I guess you would call uh, a protein rest, uh, 50 degrees C, which is what, 122 degrees Fahrenheit. And that rest is not typically long. It's usually just all in the, the mash, the, the, the strike water and, and grain mixture should strike at 50 C. A um, couple things there. One, you get to take advantage of proteolytic enzyme activity. There may be a, some other, uh, you know, enzyme activity that, that that's at work there. Um, but it also allows you the ability to get all in below SAC temperature and then ramp up and control your complete conversion program, whatever that might be. You know, most of the lagers we brew these days, even our Oktoberfest, we want to be pretty dry. Um, and oftentimes we're, we're mashing to go for, you know, 
essentially maximum fermentability or attenuation. So uh, we would then ramp up to 63C in our program, 145 degrees Fahrenheit, and we would adjust the timing there. So for PIVO currently, we're standing at about 45 minutes, I guess, uh, at uh, 145F or, or 63C. And then I like to, to, to ramp up to some place north of 155, uh, you know, some, some place that we can finish conversion. Um, and I think, Jamie, you and I probably talked about last time when I was in Europe and, and what we find with some of the European Pilsner malts is that they like an even higher temperature, something closer to 72 to complete conversion. In other words, just getting to starch neutral or, or negative, excuse me. Um, and then a final rest and, and we do a relatively low mash off rest and some might argue it's not high enough, but we've traditionally only gone to about 76 or 77 C for our mash off temperature. Um, and, and then we would drop to the lot ton and, and, and to take a step back, we would, that we would spend uh, 45 minutes at 63 C for instance, in this particular regiment, we might spend 20 or 30 minutes uh, at the higher sack temp, the alpha amylase temp. And then when we get to mash off, as long as it's homogeneous, we don't spend a lot of time at that rest. We're then uh, dropping to the lauder ton as, as quickly as we can after that. So we always do step mashes. Uh, we've integrated this protein start uh, in just about every one of the loggers we do. Um, I think you could legitimately argue that there isn't a lot of need for a protein rest, especially with modern malts, and that quite possibly you're doing a little bit of damage to foam property, uh, foam positive proteins. However, it's always worked for us, and, and we've been able to make these really lean and elegant lager beers that way. Um, so to answer your question about single infusion mashing, I would probably only employ that when I had to, if I had a, a mash lager combo or, you know, the tools wouldn't allow. Um, and yeah, yeah, I think you can make a perfectly beautiful lager that way. I'm sure there's plenty of examples, um, but we would lead towards the step infusion. How about uh, decoction? <laughs> so, I know you mentioned a second ago you're, yeah. you're dabbling in it down the down at the uh, propagator. You know, I've never been a, a huge decoction fan. Um, funny enough, I did a lot of it when I was home brewing because I had to, to to create step mashing. I would do decoction to do my steps, and then once I got into um, you know steam driven mash mixers, I, I kind of forgot about it, but. Sam's been having some really success. His system is set up for it. Um, so a lot of the beers that he's been brewing lately on the lager side have incorporated some decoction. Um, and I've tasted some beautiful beers that are decocted. So, I mean, there's no doubt that great beer can be made that way. And I actually had a, a really uh, a great trip to Prague in the Czech Republic recently um, where I tasted a number of de decocted beers that were beautiful. Uh, so no doubt great beers can be made that way. Um, is it necessary? Uh, I don't know. I haven't, I haven't tried decoction with PIVO. Don't ask me why. I just haven't gotten around to it. Maybe we should try it. Um, uh, Eric Toff always says that he has done every year he does a brew without decoction. It always goes back to decoction. So he always tests uh, the option because it does take more time and energy. And so he's always trying to just make sure that, you know, he's checking himself and he always goes back to a single, you know, it's essentially a, a modified single. I'm sure you've talked to him, modified single decoction. Um, and he claims he gets better attenuation when he does the decoction. So he's not necessarily looking for those, um, you know, boiled grain character. Uh, you know, he's not looking to add a lot of flavor that way, although I think he does get some, some malt complexity, no doubt. But he's doing it for, for attenuation reasons, which I, which I feel is really interesting and legitimate. And here in the United States, you might argue, well, there's enzymes that do that for you if you really need that. <laughs> so a couple, a couple different ways to skin a cat, depending on what you're looking for. Sure. I'm sure Eric and I drink, and, and you too, I, I've got the pictures I, of, uh, of all of us drinking quite a bit of Shinram, Hellas, and whatever else was left in the, after the, the Firestone Walker Invitational back in oh, June. And uh, there, for those that want to learn more, <laughs> Oh, right. 
And uh, for those that want to learn more about that, there is a fantastic episode that went almost, yeah, it was just short of two hours where I was, I drove up to Cheyenne and met up with Eric and we, you know, talked through all of that. He's, he's a worldwide treasure. Yeah, for I mean, sure. The, for his sure. Hellas is my desert island beer, period. I believe it. I believe it. <laughs> Mine too. Well, let's pop into another, uh, another brewing question next. Hey, this is Dale from Denver. Um, thanks for taking these questions. What are your thoughts about low oxygen brewing practices um, with things like using deoxygenated water to purge lines, mash caps, soft boils, and the like? All right. Well, Dale, uh, I feel like that's a little bit of a softball for me because I'm a big fan of DAW, deaerated water, uh, and using it in the brewery uh, to your advantage. So, um, you know, and, and some of this might be related to the size of a brewery, the scale of a brewery, but... Um, we have a deaerated water plant and, you know, I can just explain that really quickly for those who might be interested and aren't, aren't aware of it. But so we, we take reverse osmosis treated water, or essentially water that's ready for brewing or could potentially interface with beer. Um, and we sterilize it by bringing it up to approximately 80 degrees C. Uh, and then we drop it over a long column with a lot of baffles in the column. And then we blow CO2 up from the bottom of that column. And that's a, a hot deaerated water program. And the water hits the bottom of the column essentially at zero oxygen. So you've driven all the oxygen out of the water. You pick it up with a pump and bring it back to the heat exchanger using incoming water to cool along with a little bit of glycol to trim cool that water down. And so you end up with this water that's just slightly carbonated. Um, free of oxygen and then if you put it in a well purged tank you have it to use in just about any place you need to in the brewery and the main reason we purchased it is as the brewery got larger um, and the pipes got longer and longer between point a and point b where the beer had to go um, you know before we had that we might pack a line with hot water then push it out with co2 then bring beer into the system and inevitably lose some beer that foamed or you know trying to pack a pipe um, and so we justified the, the investment in the DAW system because of all the beer that we would save plus lower oxygen transfer. So now we always start the process by, you know, after we've cleaned and sanitized that pipe length or piece of equipment, packing it with DAW and either pushing it out with CO2 and bringing beer back into the system or simply just pushing the DAW out of, for instance, a pipe uh, with beer. So it saves us a bunch of product. Uh, keeps our oxygen levels low. And um, you can actually create DAW pretty easily, I think, by just delivering clean brewing water to a tank and bubbling CO2 through it and using your, your oxygen meter to to ensure that you're like single digit per million oxygen before you use it. That water could also be used if you were going to slightly high gravity brew something to hit your alcohol targets. So in this brewery in general, we'll always brew, uh, you know, a, a couple tenths above uh, the percent alcohol that we are uh, labeled as such um, and use a little bit of DAW. And usually that blend happens in pushing beer to and from the brewery. So it's kind of calculated into the process. Um, so long and short of it is I'm a big fan <laughs> of DAW. <laughs> um, what, I'm sorry, the other the other processes that were mentioned? Mash cap, slow boil, you know, other, ox other, <clears throat> other places for oxygenation as well. Uh, mash caps we haven't worked with as much. I assume that's putting inert gas in the mash mixer and kind of chasing the brew house uh, and trying to get the hot side aeration down. We haven't done as much of that work. Um, and I think in a perfect world, we would be doing that. And in fact, I think our, our wet mills have a place where we can inject either you know nitrogen or CO2 for that purpose. I think w our hesitation was more on the safety side uh, and, and the cost of, of those utilities um, you start pumping a lot of inert gas around in big brewing vessels and that, that stuff's got to go somewhere afterwards. And, you know, you got operators working around those vessels. So that would be my first hesitation there. But I think there's plenty of papers written on, on that, uh, having a positive effect, uh, on beer shelf stability. So, um, if you can do it safely, why not? And then I'm sorry, what was the last one? <laughs> Uh, uh, you know, boil vigor, uh, you know, do you slow down the boil in order to, you know, reduce any oxygenation mm -hmm. uh, potential in the kettle? Not in this brewery. Uh, we have internal calandrias, so they thermocycle um, 
and it's it's a fairly vigorous uh, circulating boil. But the theory there being is that oxygen is not uh, soluble in boiling liquid, so that you have a fairly low chance of of driving any of those reactions. Um, but that being said, everything can be done better. I think you know focusing on a gentle boil that still gets you to your DMS numbers, uh, that you still get a good true pile and coagulate away uh, the things that you don't want in your beer. Um, yeah. That's that's always a good thing. Well, let's kick into another brewing question next. But first, we all have busy lives these days and can't afford to waste a day stuck on the couch because of a few drinks the night before. Zbiotics is the answer we've all been looking for. Zbiotics is the world's first genetically engineered probiotic invented by PhD scientists to tackle rough mornings after drinking. Give Zbiotics a try for yourself. Go to zbiotics.com slash beer and brewing to get 15% off your first order when you use beer and brewing at checkout. Zbiotics is backed with a 100% money back guarantee. So if you're unsatisfied for any reason, they'll refund your money. No questions asked. And spe- speaking of Zbiotics, you know, just for science, they sent us a, a pack to test down. So last Thursday, before I went over to the GABF session, it's like, hey, you know, I'm going to try some Zbiotics because what do I have to lose? I'm about to go drink a whole bunch of beer. Nice. And, uh, you know, and so went to the session, uh, drank a whole bunch of beer. Um, then somehow, you know, because it's, it's GABF, we ended up at Bierstadt uh, Lager House and uh, finished the night very, very, very late that night uh, drinking Hellas with Bill and Ashley and a few other people. Nice. And, uh, you know, I, I still got a good night's sleep on Friday night and woke up, I, you know, I mean, I mean, there was certainly some effect, but uh, compared to the night before, I, I don't know. I think there's something there. Anyway, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep testing this out nice. uh, just just for science, just for science with Zbiotics. Anyway, also arrived mobile point of sale powers places with personality, arrived a streamlining business operations for the makers of craft with an all-in-one solution that was built with love by hospitality professionals, no contracts and no monthly fees make arrived no brainer for your craft business. Plus they're offering a special deal to our listeners get 25% off all hardware to redeem. You must launch with arrived before December 1st, 2022, go to arrived.com slash CBB to request a free customized demo. That's arrived a R R Y V E D.com forward slash CBB. A different kind of POS has arrived. All right, Matt, this next question is from somebody that you know. Uh-oh. Hey, Matt, it's Evan from Green Cheek here. <laughs> question for you. Since partnering with Duval, you've done a lot of travel to Europe and long-term stays in Belgium. As a West Coast brewer, what are some of your favorite brewing lessons you've learned from Belgian brewers that you've applied to your own beer program? Ah, uh, Evan. I knew he'd throw a hard one at me if he was going to get involved. Love that guy, by the way. Thanks, Evan, for uh, sending a question our way. He's got a second one after you answer this one. Oh, no. Okay. Um, gosh, I feel like we talked about this a little bit uh, when I was on the show last. Um, you know, I think broadly speaking, uh, and, and I would encourage all of you out there that are brewers, professional or others, to go out there and, and get exposure. Just, you know, living a day in another brewery uh, is, is a great experience. And I think that's, you know, talking about collaborations again is another, you know, great part, maybe the most important part. Of, of doing these collaboration brews in person is, is getting inside of other people's breweries and just, you know, seeing that, you know, this beautiful thing of brewing can be done a million different ways. Um, and there's a lot of really smart brewers out there who think about each step in the process a little bit differently than you do. Um, so with an open mind, you can learn a lot. Um, some of what I brought back home was, you know, it just it, it I, I I think I picked back up what I already knew in some cases that I just forgotten that other brewers were really focusing on. I know you're going to ask me for specifics, so I better think about this. But, uh, <laughs> um, you know, I, I I said over and over again that um, presentation is just such a key to Belgian beer, and whereas. Myself and my coworkers here uh, at Firestone Walker and a lot of my friends in the brewing industry, the first thing we do is we close our eyes and we stick our nose into the glass and 
yeah, we might have seen the beer in the glass, but maybe it didn't it, it didn't um, have as big of an impact on our impression. We're really working with our senses um, to dig into these beers. And, and, and working with Hedwig over at Duval, like the first thing he did would pour a beer and just kind of study the foam. And he'd study the clarity. Um, he wasn't overly obsessed with clarity, but it certainly needed to be consistent for that beer, the color. Oh my gosh, you know, when it came to wit beer, it better be white, you know, as the name suggests. Uh, and any amber off color for whatever reason, you know, game's over before you even taste the beer. So uh, just that presentation and obviously Belgium, they're just the best at having a very specific glass and shape for, for every beer. It's just so much a part of the beer culture there. So that probably is the biggest thing I came home with is just remembering that um, and, and thinking about it. And everybody here at the brewery is just sick of me talking about foam now. So I'm never <laughs> <laughs> sure, sure. Uh, what was the the biggest thing they got from you? Well, you know, I'm always pushing hops, obviously, and you know, they they love to make fun of me. They they, they would make this little motion. You can't see me right now, but they oh, there's Matt rubbing and sniffing hops again. You know, and <laughs> that was the running joke in the brewery was my obsession with hops. But I think some of that rubbed off. Um, if you've had an opportunity to try Duval Six Six Six, it's it's. It's got a unique hopping program, and there's a little touch of uh, Maddie B slash California in that beer that I'm very proud of. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that. Um, I think they also, <laughs> I don't know if they made fun of me or not, but like I, I'm one of it. I, I, I'll run around and, and make sure and double check everything. You know, <laughs> once is never enough. <laughs> so, they like to watch me run up and down the stairs a couple times every time I needed to do something. So. <laughs> Well, Evan's next question uh, is also about hops. Second question. As a former hop chemist, what do you think some of the biggest mistakes most hoppy brewers get wrong from selection to glass with how they use or select hops? Ooh, that, that's a really great question. Um, I, I don't know that I can really say. Um, you know, I, I'll, I'll just let me go to, to bitterness. Um, I think that some brewers focus on that number, um, IBU number, and and I think and maybe maybe people are coming around to this, but really it's all about what's in the glass, and that number can be a little bit deceiving, um, and even shooting for that target can be a little de- deceiving. Um, and and back to what I learned at Duval, oftentimes, uh, although that bitterness number was really important. The, the way they hopped and the amount of hop material going to the kettle was equally as important. And they would deal with it, um, you know, kind of balancing those two things at once. So, um, and I think a lot of people are coming back around. I mean, IPAs today are not as grippingly bitter as they were when we first got rolling on that style. And uh, I think there's, there's greater appeal to modern IPAs as a result. Sure, sure. And the, the quality Does that answer that question. I don't yeah. know. <laughs> the quality of that bitterness is is more important than ever. You're you're absolutely oh, I, right. He and but he also Evan also asked maybe about the selection to glass part of it. Um I I think that, you know, I we were talking about this because we just got back from selection, right? And actually I didn't go. The team just got back from selection. I didn't go this year. I let the team do it. And uh I did some selection back at home, but I didn't actually fly up to Yakima. But we talked a I mean, lot you about even went out to Germany to go look at some hops this year too, well, didn't you? Right. Like a little bit, I a little didn't bit. do selection. That's that's one way to put it. <laughs> I wasn't in Yakima this year. There okay, you I'm go. Yeah, you were just in qualify yeah. that. Qualify yeah. that. Um uh and I don't think this is right or wrong, but it was just an observation that we made is that we've not historically focused on single farms. I mean, we've had some single farm contracts, but um, for the most part, we we leave it very open. Um, and certainly we've selected from the same farm year after year, but we really look at it pretty blindly and pretty openly. We play a pretty wide open field and and bring back to the brewery what we think is the best uh, that we that we selected. And, and then we try to... St- to store and care for those hops as best we can. I think everybody's practicing that though. Um, but I guess the, the point of that being that we don't just get so hyper-focused that we have to have it from this specific farm every single year that we can look outside of that um, and, and are willing to work with a, a host or, or, or just about any farmer 
uh, for that matter, if they're delivering a great product that year. Let me build on that question. How uh, you, how important are you know either public variety, public breeding program, and hop quality group focused you know program hops to you, and how are you incorporating that into your approach to business? You know, obviously, uh, you know you are deeply involved in this, and it's uh, it's kind of a, a philosophical approach that you all are taking. Well, um, uh, putting on my hop quality group cap on, uh, we're very uh, focused on keeping some public breeding alive and helping that along um, just to keep things, you know, balanced. And I, I feel like most of the farm community and most of the merchant community is on board with that as well. Some amazing things have come out of the private breeding program. So I'm not taking anything away from them, but um, I think in terms of just a balancing act um, and having a number of breeding programs running in parallel, I think will just be the best thing for, for the business. Um, yeah, there's a financial side to that as well, too. I mean, ultimately, those hops typically come in a little bit less expensive to the, to the brewer that also help balance things out to some extent. But, um, you know, I'm not completely firmly in one camp or the other. I believe in a balanced you know, balanced hop program out there in the hole. Sure, sure. Um, I think you'll recognize the next guy uh, asking the question. Hey, Matt, it's Vinny here. I hope (laughs) you and the family are well. I've been meaning to ask you this question, but have never got to it. And it's a topic we've discussed at Russian River over the years. Your dry hop beers have such a clean, crisp, and precise hop aroma, which I love. When making a more traditional dry hop addition, do you base the exact time in which the dry hops are added on a specific number of days after fermentation has started, a precise attenuation drop, or are you looking for a yeast cell count before you make the dry hop addition, which I know some breweries do? And if not based on cell count, do you track what your cell count was at time of dry hop? In general, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this topic. Ah, oh, Vinny, that's... That's awesome that you'd call in and think about it. That's awesome. <laughs> well, um, yeah, actually, Vinny and I have talked a lot about dry hopping. Maybe we haven't had, talked about this specific. Um, so I'll just take a step back. We It depends on the yeast strain that we're using. So I'll just start with our house ale strain, which is not Cal Ale. Um, and so it, it does behave a little bit differently. And I understand that Brewers who use that yeast um, sometimes have to alter their dry hopping program to get the the results that they're looking for. And, um, you know, our yeast is more of English um, derivation, I guess. We think it's probably closest to Fuller's yeast or some London yeast, some English ale yeast, industrial yeast. Uh, It's a fairly high ester producer. It's also a very high flocculator. Um, So, you know... To, to just walk through our program, you know, we would start our fermentation pitching at, at pretty normal amounts, half, say half a million cells uh, to a million cells per milliliter per degree Play-Doh, depending on the type of beer we're making. Um, and we see some pretty massive growth uh, in, a, in a normal IPA. We might see upwards of 90 to 100 million cells per milliliter at high croissant. Um and we typically, rather than it just being, you know, if, if the day we brew is day zero, day one uh, is that that first 24 hours after uh, and onward and onward, we're, we're oftentimes dry hopping on day four or five, but that's not, it's, it's not based on time exactly. It's based on the fermentation, um, as, as Vinny suggested. And we would like to see the beer be below one degree Play-Doh, I would say probably almost like a half a degree Play-Doh above terminal gravity. Um, that also is somewhat beer dependent, but on average, let's just say that. So it, we're, we're close to fully attenuated, but not completely. Um, we would probably be down to certainly less than half the yeast mass, 50 million cells per milliliter, but more times than not, it's far below that 20 or 30 million cells per milliliter. And yes, we are counting yeast. It's every day uh, after we start the fermentation, uh, we take uh, a handheld temperature to make sure that the temperature uh, probe is reading correctly. We take a sample and count yeast. Uh, We look at pH. um, And uh, obviously we're smelling and and tasting that beer as we go along. Um, 
but you know, those, those are some of the key things that we're looking at. Um, and so that cell count is, is, is written down every day on our brew logs. Um, dry hop would happen. Yeah. Between that, let's just say in that 30 million cells per milliliters zone, day four or five, half a degree Play-Doh above terminal. And that's when we would make our, if most of our beers are single dry hop, but that was, that'd be the first dry hop point. I love the, uh, you know, as you mentioned before, the double checking, you just have to, <laughs> you, you have to confirm the, the accuracy and, uh, you know, of your own temperature probes just with a hand measurement every, every time. Well, well now we build tanks with multiple temperature probes. So. <laughs> <laughs> All yeah. right. All right. Insane. Love it. Love it. Uh, I, there's, there's another one. Uh... I've got one more thing to ask, which is definitely on the more lighthearted side. As you know, my nickname for you is Batman because you used to dry hop in the dark in the early years at Firestone Walker. If you have time, I thought it'd be fun for you to talk about dry hopping in the dark, as well as the time when you went to the local record store after making a dry hop edition. See you soon, Matt. Cheers. Well, I'll make it short and sweet, but the, the brewery here in Paso Robles, well, if you've ever been to Paso Robles, the, the sun is relentless. And uh, and this brewery was built with a lot of uh, passive solar in it. So when you would be up on top of the tanks, you might as well be outdoors. I mean, the sun was just blazing down on you. And uh, <laughs> I was probably being a little crazy and neurotic about it all. But uh, I swore one time when, when the brewers up, and oftentimes we would go up there and shake hops into the top of the tanks and we get the hop volcano and there'd be a big mess on top of the tank. And then sure enough, the sun would beat down on those tanks and you'd start smelling that, um, you know, kind of skunky smell of, of beer and hops that saw too much sunlight. And then you'd walk into the brewery and smell and I just thought it was the most disgusting thing in the world. But, um, I swore one time that we skunked a batch of pale 31 uh, because we dry hopped in the middle of the day, right underneath one of those. So I forbid the dry hopping during the day <laughs> and made it happen on the second or third shift, <laughs> which by the way, I was doing initially. <laughs> now, if Ali Razi was here, he's like, not for long, buddy. And then of course, if I'd be away from the brewery, they dry hop during the day anyway. But um, it was more about just <laughs> me being a little bit neurotic. And then the second part of that uh, question, and they all made fun of me for it and called me Batman. So I, I paid the price. And then the second part of that is that after dry hopping one day, um, in a, in a, I think a lot of people have done this, like after a day of work in the brewery and you've had beer and hop dust on your clothes and on your arms and everything like that, you go out to your car and if it's a sunny day, you start smelling like you've got a, a bag of the kind in your back pocket everywhere you go. And uh, I went down to uh, Boo Boo Records in San Luis Obispo, you'd think they were really liberal minded. It's a record store for crying out loud. And I walked in there to buy a record and the woman wouldn't serve me. Uh, she said, you can't bring that in here. You need to, you need to leave. I'm like, can't bring what in here? <laughs> she thought I had something in my pocket and I was just a sunstruck brewer. <laughs> so, so, so dank. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we've got uh, we now we've got a question uh, on the environmental tip, and again, I think you'll recognize the uh, asker of this question. Hey, Matt, this is Stan. Uh, I was wondering if you anticipate climate change will impact your hop choices in the future, and if so, how? Ah, uh, Stan, man, Stan wrote the hop book, and I have mad respect for Stan, and I haven't seen enough of Stan lately. So, thanks so much for calling in, Stan. I, I've gotten um, to see Stan a whole bunch. Uh, you know, popped up for our, our best in beer judging, and then uh, Joe and Stan and Dari and I all went to, to go see Wilco at Red Rocks after that. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you know, we've we've had some good time. I missed him in Yakima. They were there like a day after we left, but you know, of course, saw him this past weekend. Like, I'm, well, now now I love Stan even more that I know he's a Wilco fan. Oh heck yeah. Well, I mean, that's, that's a but great he, he is beating question. the environmental drum, and uh, he's coming for your cashmere, just, just warning your brewers out there. Um, <laughs> but, I love but, cashmere, too. You know, but seriously, you know, you know, but what he's saying is absolutely true, especially this year with hop harvest, when we look at what's happening in uh, you know, Czechia uh, with a really just, just horrible, horrible harvest. It's probably down 50%. 
you know, um, 40%, 50%, somewhere in there. Germany, you know, has had a really difficult harvest this year. Um, there's some major environmental impacts. You know, even even Yakima in the Pacific Northwest is down, you know, 20% this year. Um, you know, that environmental impact of hops, the what climate change is doing to hops, and also the impact of hops on and the agriculture and everything else on climate change itself, you know, goes both ways there. Um, all of those are having impact on the agriculture. How do you foresee that having some impact in the way that you select, use hops and, uh, and employ them in the future? Yes. Stan brings up a, a really important point. And I don't think anybody is denying that, you know, there's some extreme pressures on, on these growers around the world. Um, I, I think immediately the European growers, as we know, since they have a smaller percentage of their fields under irrigation, are being impacted uh, the most. And probably, you know, their breeding programs weren't necessarily breeding hops for these elevated temperatures and drought conditions, maybe as aggressively as was kind of natural case in Yakima, since it's a more aggressive uh, growing environment, at least higher temperatures on a regular basis. Um, but always under irrigation. Nothing grows in Yakima without irrigation, right? Right. Um, so Stan just brings up this amazing point. So um, how is it going to impact our our purchasing? Well, hops are going to have to go up in price if we continue to have these off years. If this, you know, if this is the new normal, then brewers are going to have to respond with, you know, again through contracting and negotiating, um, paying for that extra you know, that drop in yield uh, and, and what the growers are going to need to do to address it. Um, and then the price of hops in Europe has been uh, considerably lower than it has been in the United States. So I would anticipate that changing. Some breeding is going to have to happen. Um, and it's it's interesting because, you know, I, you've heard me talk in the past about German flavor hops, Mosaic, Blanc, uh, Melon, and those were crosses with Cascade for the most part. And that actually bred in some uh, at least heat resistance, maybe not, you know, extreme drought resistant, but they are, it's, it is a, a step in the right direction in terms of breeding. Now, those aroma profiles aren't your typical noble. Uh, so there's some work to be done there. And yeah, I mean, I, I'll admit I need to get educated. I, I didn't know cashmere was an environmentally uh, <laughs> questionable hop. So I need to get educated on that. Um, but again, I think most of that's going to impact brewers in the pocketbook, and that's going to drive the conversation and the decision making for sure. Sure, sure. Well, I've got a more uh, another positive, more positive question from Stan next. Stan, again, I was wondering what newer experimental hop varieties have you most excited, and what about them makes them different? Well, S Stan studies this. Uh, far more than I probably do or spends a lot more time. So he's, all of this is going to be old news to, to Stan, but I'll tell you what um, has excited us the last couple of years. We've been up to Yakima. Um, I always got to get here. I get, I warned you and I was going to have to get my phone out and open my notes. Totally here. okay. It's so funny because every time I talk hops with um, brewers, Vinny being one of them, Evan another, and will say, hey, did you try this experimental hop? Everyone opens up notes on their phone <laughs> and scrolls through. So we, I have this extensive notes uh, on some of the ex experimentals. So um, in no particular order here, but 1019, um, this is one of Michael Ferguson's kind of babies. Um, maybe it'll be the first one named out of the program since he's taken over uh, HB uh, or Hop Breeding Company, HBC. Um, yeah, 1019 is a fun one. Yeah, and, and I think two years ago, we tasted some beers that really impressed us. Uh, and the folks came back this year equally impressed and talking about it again. So, um, you know, I, I have notes. I don't know if they match up with your stand, but I got kind of a tropical. I got a little bit of watermelon, strawberry, but there's, there's an element of pine. Um, so some familiar Pacific Northwest character about it and a little bit of tropical. So, you know, it's just a fun, fresh, lively uh, expression. So I'm, I'm still really excited about that one. Um, on the public side, I think everybody's been talking about Vista. And um, I think the verdict's out in terms of the trial brewing that we've done. 
And I suppose what I would say is that I anticipate that being a good hop. I think it'll be an IPA hop, maybe a good blending hop. It'll take a little while to get to know it, but I think it, it, it just points to some cool things happening and coming out of um, that program. Um, ba- back to HBC, uh, we've had some good luck with uh, 630 and 638. Um, and also 586. So those are three that are on our radar and pretty high on my list here. And most of that, again, is pointed towards IPA brewing. Um, you, you know, I've said this before, Firestone's not the first kid on the block usually to adopt a new experimental. We, we now have our, what we affectionately call our little MFers, our little mini fermenters, our SS Brewtech one uh, barrel fermenters. And so we do exhaustive uh, hop trialing in those. In fact, they're almost always full with some single hop brews in them that we taste through sensory. So we're, try- we're doing our best to get to know these hops, um, but we're a little slow to adopt them in the production side of things. Um, you know, sometimes I look in our hop closet and I'm like, oh man, we got a lot here already. <laughs> a lot of hops we love and <laughs> deserve our attention. Um, but if I had to pick one of those, maybe I just, you know, I'll just say 1019 right now might be the one I'm personally most excited about. Um, you, you mentioned Czech Republic and uh, I just got back from there and was introduced and got a chance to rub a whole mess of hops I didn't know existed. Um, there's a whole series of hops named after the planets. Um, <laughs> there's uh, a whole bunch of derivations of saws. There's a really cool um, IPA hop called Eris um, coming out of the Czech Republic. So there are some hops there that I need to get some samples of and and try as well. All right. We're going to quickly go do our research on that. Man, okay. (laughs) (laughs) Although I imagine this might be a difficult year to to get a lot of samples out of there if if, if they're dealing with some of those other issues. Okay. I've got one last question for you. Uh, You know, we've seen a... I mean, you guys are, are have made award-winning IPAs for you know multiple decades now, and your late newest release with Hopnosis uh, made a shift to use lager yeast in a in a kind of different fermentation approach. Um, Sam has written a really nice article for our, our next issue, of, uh, you know, on this kind of trend within brewing. But uh, talk to me for a second about uh, taking that kind of approach, using lager yeast in this different kind of, uh, you know, context, making hop forward beers that you are selling as IPA. Why do that? Why change that up? And uh, what have you learned in the process of, of making some of those changes? You know, not just test batching, but even launching a beer as large, you know, as a production batch like, uh, like Hopnosis. There were a couple of good question, by the way. Great question. Thanks for mentioning hypnosis. Uh, that was a, f- a fun project. And then, you know, back to the question about R and D, it was a perfect example of we had the better part of a year, so there wasn't a ton of pressure on us in terms of. You know, I feel I felt like we had plenty of time to do trial brewing and 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 get this right. Um, and and for the longest time, we had talked about making hoppy beers in general. Um, you know, IPAs or others trying to use lager yeast. Um, and I don't know that this is really proven out, but, you know, conversations I've had with Vidi and other brewers about the fact that we know lager yeast produces a certain amount of SO2 naturally through fermentation. Um, that does sometimes come with a sulfitic aroma and flavor that doesn't play particularly perfectly with hops. So, uh, but that in and it itself is an antioxidant. And, you know, the dream was, could you combine lager yeast with an IPA to make a more flavor stable beer? Um, and again, like I said, I, I don't know that that's really played out because I, what we found is as we've had to elevate our temperatures a little bit uh, in primary to get that yeast to perform, uh, produce a little less sulfur uh, and make the beer the way we want it to be in a balanced way. I believe that we're losing some of the benefit of that um, SO2 that would otherwise be protecting the beer, or we haven't seen an extreme extension of flavor stability in any case through using that yeast. But I think there might be a little bit of something there. So that was one angle. Um, 
Another angle was that, and I mentioned our house ale yeast earlier, it's so distinctive um, and we've made so many IPAs with it. And every time I pick up a Union Jack, all I taste is the, I taste the yeast. <laughs> I mean, I taste the hops, but I'm always thinking about that house character being, it has such a distinct fingerprint on that beer. And so we were releasing another West Coast IPA. Union Jack was staying in the portfolio. And so it was a, another opportunity to differentiate kind of the quote unquote house character that the house ale yeast lends to each and every one of these beers. And we already had the yeast in house. So it wasn't like we're adopting a new yeast this time. It wasn't like hazy IPA where we needed to bring in, um, you know, our, the, the, the haze positive, we're using a 38, the London three, but, um, so it wasn't a full blown adoption. This was already a child living in the house and, just deployed them into a different type of situation <laughs> brewing wise. Um, yeah. I mean, that's kind of the long and the short of it. Trying to differentiate the flavor was more than anything. And obviously we were influenced by all the cold IPA brewing activity that was going on uh, that our friends up North uh, kind of started talking so much about. And um, we chose not to call it a cold IPA, not for any really good reason. I, I didn't, I don't think this was even the conversation, but in one sense, I don't know that we wanted to get caught in an eddy of uh, a new style. You know, we really were just trying to produce a great IPA uh, and something that was we could clearly drink next to Union Jack. And you could say these are very different beers. It's funny. There are a fair number of brewers out there that are now doing the same thing, making all of their IPAs with uh, 3470 or some, you know, some variation thereof. Well, and, uh, I mean, you got Bob yeah. making beers out of Highland Park, some of the most beautiful beers you'll ever taste. And they're all made with that lager yeast. So he's really perfected it um, at, at his scale. And uh, we're trying to do, I mean, I was heavily influenced by him. We went down and did a collaboration with him and I was just fascinated tasting those beers off the tank and then tasting them off draft and tasting them out of the can and how good, how well that worked uh, and how the control he had with that yeast. So yeah, that was an inspiration as well. Well, if it's any uh, anything at all, our blind judges in our IPA issue this this last year uh, really loved Top Gnosis, and it was the top score. We did throw it in the the cold IPA category because I nice. had that inside knowledge that you guys had been brewing it that way. And whether it's awesome. whether it's truly a cold IPA and what that where that definition is does does it have to include adjunct to be well. There you go. It doesn't a, have adjunct, right. so maybe but yeah. So I don't know if it is or not. Well, I'm not going to let that one go. We don't. We try not to to draw the lines too tightly around that. But I, I had scored in the very very high 90s and was the top wow. score in that category there. So whatever you're doing, it's making a really delicious tasting beer. Um, Matt, thanks for joining me for this direct fire episode of the podcast. AccuBrew is an analytical tool designed to collect and compare the information brewers need to produce consistent results. CanCraft and BSG have you covered with low minimums and full service support. ZBiotics is the world's first genetically engineered probiotic to tackle rough mornings after drinking and get 25% off all arrived hardware when you launch with arrived before December 1st, 2022. As always, go to beerandbrewing.com, click on that subscribe button, let us know this content matters to you. Of course, if you'd like to leave a positive review on your podcast app of choice, uh, that's great too. But subscriptions are ultimately what makes it possible for us to bring you this podcast every week. Matt, if people want to learn more about Firestone Walker, where do they find you guys? Or is there anything else that you're particularly passionate about that you want to slide in here right at the very end? Well, how did I do? What do you think? You crushed it, of course. Oh, <laughs> I don't know. Some, some pretty heavy hitters. Those are some... You pulled some great questions from some pretty sharp folks out there. Well, so. it's funny. Of course, you know, of course, uh, when I, I told some folks that uh, we're going to have you on, <laughs> hey, would you want to throw a question our way? Uh, everyone jumped at the uh, at the opportunity to to, uh, to do that. So, yeah. you know, you got some good friends out there that, uh, that uh -huh. want to set you up for some success on this. <laughs> Oh, that was great. Well, um, where do you find us? Yeah, firestonebeer.com, and we're on the Instagrams and the Facebook and all that stuff. Um, yeah. Uh, Is there a Firestone beer that you're particularly passionate about right now that you just, uh, you know, everyone should go out and try? Pivo, of course. Yes! Pivo. <laughs> <laughs> it's back in cans, and uh, we're brewing it. It's in the tanks. It's awesome. Fantastic. Keep hope alive. Keep Pivo. Pivo forever. <laughs> Matt, thanks for joining me on the podcast. It's great talking to you as always. Cheers. Likewise, Jamie. Thank you.
This podcast is brought to you by Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine for those that love to make and drink great beer. Learn more online or subscribe at beerandbrewing.com or find us on social media at craftbeerbrew.